achieved. He is back! And the he I am speaking about is the last Emperor, Fedor Emelianenko. We saw him return, I guess, officially to MMA. Uh, or at least show his intention to return to MMA at the Bellator Dynamite 1 event. But the big question is, who cares? Under the circumstances, does it really matter? Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. And it seems like forever since I've seen that. As we're coming off one of the longest layoffs in recent memory for UFC action. Three-week layover between events. And I'm coming off a pretty darn respectable event. But before we talk about that, let's preview this card. We are looking at the upcoming UFC Fight Night 75, which will take place in Japan. Uh, on September 27th, six main card fights, which I'll give you my predictions for in this on uh, this episode of the show. All five prelims will be available at KamikazeOverdrive.net. You can also buzz over there and check out the prediction panel. You can check out uh, Radio MMA. Uh, a lot of things you, you can do there, as well as buying my bet packs. I'm coming off a very solid showing. I went at uh, UFC 191. I went 8-3, and three, which was pretty darn good. But more importantly, my bet pack produced 79.41 win units, uh, winning units. Uh, my value list, pretty darn impressive. I had Joe Riggs with the upset. I had uh, Corey Anderson with the upset. I also had Raquel Pennington pulling the upset. I also told you in the bet pack to pick, take that fight to go under. And that's a pretty impressive fight for me to pick, I think, because initially I had Jessica Andrade in the first matchup, which was correct. And here I switched to the underdog Pennington. I saw some things, and it turned out just the way I said. So picking her as the underdog, picking her to finish that fight, too, was pretty darn impressive. I also had Tiago Tratter, and I said I had Joe Riggs as well. So I had a good, you know, good run with underdogs. I also told you my number one play for the night was uh, Paige Van Zant, uh, Alex Chambers to go under, which it did. Overall, it was a very, very solid night, so definitely consider buying my bet packs. You can purchase, um, let's see, a three of the uh, remaining four cards in the fall subscription. So UFC Fight Night 75, UFC 192, and UFC Fight Night 76. So that's three bet packs. It's normally would cost you 30 bucks. You'll be able to buy all three for $25. So save yourself five bucks. So certainly consider doing that. Or buy the single packs. It's entirely up to you, but certainly consider doing that. Now we saw Bellator Dynamite 1. A lot of pomp and circumstance. I enjoyed the event overall. It was pretty fun. I actually put a little prediction down on, just informal in the comments. Someone asked me for one, and I was bang on, including saying, you know, it's not that far of a stretch to see why. Probably lots of people prognosticated this, that Liam McGeary would beat Tito Ortiz with a submission off his back, and it's exactly what happened. But the fact of the matter is we saw Fedor Emelianenko return in kind of an awkward uh, segment of the show. Uh, the former owner of Pride came back, said he's back. He's going to have a New Year's Eve show in Japan, hosted on Spike, headlined by Fedor Emelianenko. Who's he going to fight? He could fight a heavyweight from uh, Bellator, quite possibly. Maybe Randy Couture comes out of retirement for that matchup. I actually think that's who it might possibly be. But either way, Fedor talked about in the media he wants to fight the best. And as much as, you know, we're not, you know, I'm not a huge Dana White fan, if you're not in the UFC, you're probably not fighting the best. There are great fighters outside of the UFC. Bellator has some. World Series of Fighting has some. We certainly seen uh, saw them last weekend. But the fact of the matter is, if you are not... Uh, fighting in the UFC, especially in the heavyweight division because it's so, so thin elsewhere. It's not even that deep in the UFC, but you're not fighting the best. I'd like to see Fedor up against Frank Mir. I'd like to see him up against, you know, rematch Bigfoot Silva. Like, rematch Andre Arlovsky. There's lots of fights there. Maybe get that fight with Josh Barnett or Alistair Overeem. There's lots of fights. And obviously, potentially fight Fabrizio Verdum in a rematch of the title. There, I keep saying there's lots of fights in the UFC that have been very interesting, and he's going to be, you know, I just, at this point, I just don't understand. I don't, I think, I don't understand why he came out of retirement unless it's for money, unless it's for his agent pushing him to get money. Either way, I think it's a pointless return considering what, how it's going to go down. Unless they find a whole wealth of unknown heavyweights for him to fight, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, one other thing, I've been doing some work on my website. Hopefully you like the new look. I'm continuing. I'm incorporating a little more yellow and gray into my uh, colors. I think it looks pretty cool. I really like that uh, countdown... Uh, new countdown look. Overall, it's been a lot of... It's been a headache, at least, uh, but... You know, with some help from some very important people, we got things up and running and looking a little bit d different. I also just ordered a brand new computer, which I'm eagerly awaiting the arrival of a brand new laptop. Uh, so I'm very excited about that, too. Either way, I'm pretty excited about this coming, upcoming event. Six main card fights. Let's get to that first matchup. The opening fight of the night takes place in the featherweight division. It is actually the finals of the Road to UFC Japan event, which was kind of like a Japanese version of the Ultimate Fighter, which featured Josh Barnett and Roy Nelson picking fighters, eight Japanese-based fighters working their way back uh, to the tournament finals and a potential UFC contract. It kind of flew under the radar, but still here we are with the finals. And we have Mizutu Hirota, former Strikeforce and UFC veteran, 17-7-0 in one half of the finals, taking on Tirihutu Ishihara with a record of seven wins and two losses. Uh, as I said, 
finals of the Road to UFC Japan tournament. Uh, both earned a pair of wins to get here, so it was an eight-man tournament, quarterfinals, semifinals, and now here they are in the finals. For Hirota, as I said, this is the second opportunity in the UFC. He went 0-2 in his first run. Uh, in two pretty tough matchups that he fared fairly well and didn't get blown out of the water, just didn't get his hand raised. Since uh, departing the UFC, he's won three in a row plus these two matches, these informal uh, tournament matches. So he's on a fight, you know, unofficial five fight winning streak. All th all of his fights came in deep, and his last two matchups were, were victories by knockout. For Ishihara, he has lost just twice in his professional career. He's only on a one fight winning streak professionally, but again unofficially three wins in a row. He's lost just twice in his professional career. The two men that have beaten both currently UFC rostered fighters in Yuta Sasaki and Michihiro Takano, uh, Tanaka. So two very capable fighters are able to put him out. Other than that, he's been very strong. Physically, both guys five foot seven, A two-inch reach advantage for Ishihara. He's also 10 years younger than Hirota. But a big experience advantage for Hirota. 25 fights to 10 and quality of opposition fighting in the UFC, fighting in strike force. You know, fighting some high-level guys in deep and Sengoku. Certainly, he's fought some better, uh, the better competition. For Ishihara, six of his seven wins have come by knockout. His only win that wasn't by knockout was his pro debut. So it shows you, you know, he's got finishing power and he knows how to put guys away. Six first-round finishes. He's never gone beyond the second round in any of his matchups. Uh, for Hirota, ten wins by knockout. He is seven and six in decision. So he's got 13 fights that have gone the distance. But he's you know, almost fit 500 when fights do go. It's 50-50 when fights go the distance. He's the only one in fights that go uh, end in submission. And he is the former deep in Sengoku lightweight champion. So he has a lot of experience, quality experience, that favors Hirota in this matchup. For Ishihara, in the fight footage I've seen of him, he seems a little bit too loose with his technique. And overall, he's just a little bit too inexperienced coming into this matchup. For Hirota, he has some very tight, crisp striking. He needs to you know, be wary of either getting drawn into a brawl or possibly getting put on his back, which has been his downfall in previous, uh, previous fights. The experience favors Hirota in significant factor. Uh, he's also fought in the UFC before, so that should also favor him significantly as well because he knows what to expect. He shouldn't be caught up in the moment like I expect Ishihara to be. Uh, overall, Ishihara, he's never gone beyond. Like never going beyond the second round. You know, used to knocking guys out in the opening frame. If he can't get Hirota out of there in the first round, that makes it very tough in second round and even more difficult third round. And I think that shows up here. Hirota outstrikes him, stunts that early onslaught, and eventually pulls away in a more one-sided fight as it progresses. And my prediction is uh, Mitsu, Mis Mizuhutu, Mizutu, my apologies, Mizuto Hirota to defeat Terahito Ishihara by decision. Butchered that. It's been, I'm a little rusty. Fight number two in the main card drops down to the Bantamweight division as Japanese legend Kid Yamamoto, 18-6-0 with two no contests, takes on Matt the Crowbar Hobar with a current record of nine wins and three losses. Now, Kid Yamamoto is back in action, and he very well could be looking to retire after this matchup, retire at home, and go out with a victory. And the UFC is trying to find him a winnable fight, and it just, you know, it hasn't materialized. He last fought at UFC 184, which ended in a no contest against Roman Salazar in a fight that he appeared to be en route to winning or a he, at least potentially he was very competitive in. He's had seven months since that last ma matchup. Prior to that, he was out of action for almost exactly three years. He only has one win in his last seven trips to the cage or ring, depending on where he was fighting. He's 0-3 with one no contest in the UFC, and the last time he paired back-to-back -back wins together was in 2007. So that kind of gives you the state of affairs for the once, you know, highly regarded legend. For Hobart, out of action for nine months. So he's actually been on the shelf a little bit longer than expected. He's 1-2 and two so far in the octagon with a loss to Pedro Munoz, which is which is nothing to sneeze about as he is an absolute killer. He also lost to Sergio Pettis in a fairly competitive back-and-forth matchup. For Hobar, physically, the attributes really stack up in his favor. Six inches taller than Kid, he'll have a four-inch reach advantage, and a big number here, he is ten years younger. Uh, than his Japanese opponent. Uh, Hobar's record, it really doesn't blow you away. His four wins by submission, three of which coming by rear naked chokes, which appears to be his submission of, uh, of uh, favor. Four and one in fights that go the distance, and he's one and two in fights ended by knockouts. So he's been knocked out twice, which is probably Kid Yamamoto's best avenue for victory, and that number was probably looked at when they paired these two up. For Yamamoto, 13 wins by knockout. Big number. He's, he's, we know he's, he throws very hard. He's got significant power. He knows how to put guys away. But the rest of his numbers, 2-1 and one in fights ended by submission. He's 3-4 and four when going the distance. And overall, in his career, when he can't knock his opponent out, he is 5-5. Five and five. He has been knocked out once, so if you throw that into the thing, when he doesn't knock his opponent out, he's 5-6 and six overall, which is certainly concerning. He has one non-KO win in his last 16 fights, so it basically tells you if, you can't knock, if he can't knock his opponent out, he's in for a tough battle. Uh, what he does well, he throws a nice left jab. 
jab. He will also mix an elite uppercut, which can be effective. Some hard low kicks, lots of movement, darts in and out. He relies on his speed to do that, and when he was younger, that seemed to be you know a very effective way to fight. Unfortunately, at 38 years of age, which is a very old age for the lighter weight classes, that speed is certainly not there anymore, and I think it shows up in the way he fights. I expect him to come out very aggressive in this matchup, try and get uh, Hobart out of there as quickly as possible, put him on his heels and overwhelm him. Unfortunately for Yamamoto, not a ton of volume in this last matchup. He was throwing a lot of singles. He tried to counter as Salazar came forward with mixed results. He was taken down once in that matchup. He has had issues with being taken down before, even though he's shown good counter wrestling earlier in his career. Darren Uyaniyama took him down twice. I had some prolonged top control and an upset that I predicted. DJ uh, Demetrius Johnson scored 10 takedowns, which isn't, you know... Who hasn't been taken down by Demetrius Johnson? Uh, also, in uh, a two-round fight in Dream, Joe Warren put him on his back four times and, and beat him as a result of his wrestling. And again, that could be an avenue that I think Hobart will most likely try to capitalize on. We saw him score two takedowns against Sergio Pettis and have some success there. In his lone UFC win against Aaron Phillips, he scored six takedowns and really controlled him from top position for long durations of that matchup. Look for him. If he does look for the takedown, single leg, turn that corner, run the pipe, and put him on his backside. Uh, he also has success timing kicks and latching on for a takedown. Uh, he, and against Phillips, he did a nice job of sticking to him like glue. Once he was on top, he stayed active and held, you know, held that top position as long as he possibly could. Now his striking isn't anything special, but he brings constant pressure, which does help make up for his lack of overall skill. He has a decent left hand with some pop. We saw him drop Sergio Pettis with it, and he landed on Aaron Phillips a couple of times. He does a good job of keeping his chin down and his hands up, which will be a key to his success here against Kid Yamamoto. He was getting tagged a couple of times by Pettis, but scored some nice reactionary takedowns as a result, which I would hope to see him do here. Both Pettis and Phillips had success on attacking off their back, and that's something Kid Yamamoto must do if he does get put down on his back, but that's a position he does not want to be in. With Yamamoto fighting at home, that's a massive you know, advantage for him, but he's a smaller fighter. He's 10 years younger, and his relative uh, lack of activity over the last couple of years certainly shows up here. If Kid can't score that early knockdown, uh, knockout, he has to remain very active to convince the judges he won this matchup. I think it's going to be very tough. I think Hobart forces him to work very early, grinds him into the mat, remains active once getting in, in top position, and my prediction is Matt Hobar to defeat Kid Yamamoto by decision. Fight number three in the main card uh, stays in the UFC's Bantamweight division and has the potential to really be an entertaining and good back-and-forth scrap as the number eighth ranked uh, Takeya Mizagaki, 29-0, taking on George Roop, 15-12-1. Uh, both men are trying to stop slides down the divisional ranks. Mizugaki is closing in on a possible title shot when he got derailed by Dominic Cruz, and George Roop was gaining a little bit of respect before his last matchup. Uh, we saw Mizugaki win a very close decision against uh, Brian Caraway here in Saitama last time he fought there, but he also lost a controversial decision a little bit earlier that against Chris Carriasso in a matchup I felt he had done enough to win. Uh, his most recent matchups or fights have not gone well for the Japanese fighter. He got destroyed by Dominic Cruz, which isn't a huge deal considering how you know highly you know Dominic Cruz is the uncrowned champion. I guess he had the title belt and he had never lost it. Uh, he also saw, saw by Aljamain Sterling, who is a prospect on the rise. That certainly knocked him down the rankings, but still, it's a loss that you, you see. It's you know Sterling is a tough opponent. For Roop, he started two and zero when moving to, back to 135 pounds, including beating former champion Brian Bowles, which was a pretty big uh, feather in his cap. Against Francisco Rivera, he was having success early before getting knocked out. He beat Dustin Kimura, which was a nice, uh, you know, recovery for him. But then, you know, he got submitted, uh, sorry, he uh, got knocked out by Rob Font, and that really took him right off the rails. Roop's been on the shelf for over 14 months, so he's been away. A lot of people probably missing him for that. Uh, physically, 6-inch height advantage for Rupi. He's very tall for the division. He'll have a 4-inch reach advantage. Mizugaki is 2 years younger. Now, for Takeya, he's a grinder. He's 14-5 and five in fights that go the distance, which is primarily what happens in his fights. He does have 5 wins by knockout. We saw him drop Francisco Rivera in, in a very early exchange, so it shows he has a little bit of pop in his hands. He has been knocked out twice, including the Dominic Cruz fight, and he has been submitted twice by the aforementioned Aljamain Sterling and Uriah Faber, so no shame in that. Uh, for George Roop, 7-3 and three when going the distance, but his... Other numbers, very concerning. 4-4 four and four in fights ended by knockout. 4-4 four and four in fights ended by submission. So he's very finishable, if you will. Uh, chin is a major concern. We saw uh, Font, uh, Francisco Rivera, Cub Swanson, and Mark Hominick all knocking him out. Four of his last five losses have come by knockout. He's, except I said, he's exceptionally tall for the division, but he's very awkward. Uh, and... So, you know, he doesn't fight tall, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, big question with him, though, is will the cut plus the layoff and the travel west to east impact? And those could all be major things. You know, he really cuts down a lot to get down to 135 pounds, and I wonder if that won't affect him, me having not done it for a while, having to do it in a foreign country, and having to do it after, you know, 
Just it's just a circumstance that I don't think is going to be a positive for him. For Mizugaki, is excellent, very tight, crisp boxing works very well in the clinch, and he'll be looking to close the distance and negate that reach advantage. The striking exchange rate for Mizugaki is almost equal. He gets hit way too much for my liking, which tends to keep opponents in the fight. When he had his recent, I think he won five fights in a row, and could have been arguably seven with the Carriasso fight. He was simply busier than most of his opponents, outlanded them, kept pushing forward, and that's where he found his success. But when he sits back and lets his opponent go go uh, shot for shot, he you know fights tend to be a lot closer than they need to be. For Mizugaki, he's also shown his ability to work his wrestling. 12 takedowns over his 6-1 run. He could try to mix it up a little bit. Rupe has a 58% takedown defense, but he's been taken down 12 times in his 9 UFC fights, so he could be put on his back as well, and that could score some points for uh, Mizugaki. Now, as I said, Rupe has a very awkward style. He's very tall for the division, but he doesn't use his reach to the utmost. He crouches down when attacking, raises his chin up when, when he's under attack, and that leaves him very vulnerable to getting knocked out and getting cracked with, some, with an overhand right or left. He does throw a decent jab and a nice push kick, which can back up opponents off, and I really like that. He uses a lot of movement, a lot more than you expect for a guy his size. He has a slight edge in strikes landed per minute, but his strikes his order per minute is much better than Mizugaki's. He gets hit at almost one strike less per minute. He has some power, especially if he can counter his opponents. He comes forward and transition their forward energy into the impact of the strike. He can also work on the ground as well, but again, he seems to favor that striking exchange. If Roop, Roop can use his movement and ranged weapons, he could outwork Mizugaki and, and just simply land more strikes. Mizugaki, though, should be able to close the distance, land in tight, use that boxing to take advantage of Roop's defensive gaps. With Mizugaki at home, that's going to help him in a decision, but my prediction is to KO Mizugaki to defeat George Roop by TKO. Here's another matchup that's absolutely flying under the radar, and if you're you know if you're not a fan of the 125 pounders, I think this has a lot of potential to change your opinion of them. As former title challenger Kaiuji Horaguchi, 15-1-0, takes on Chico, the King Camus, 14-6-0. Uh, coming into this matchup, very interesting uh, scenario. Uh, we look first. Horaguchi's coming off that title fight loss against DJ. He was submitted in the final second of that fight. Is he going to endure a title fight letdown? That's something I've talked about in several scenarios before. If he endures that title fight letdown, you know, where he is he at uh, mentally? Camus lost a very tough fight against a potential future title challenger in Henry Cejudo, which is also a scenario that, you know, it can hurt a guy's psyche. But again, he's still trying to work his way through the division. He hasn't been to the top of the mountain yet, so it's not going to be as devastating as losing a title fight. Uh, like Horaguchi did. For Camus, this is his third fight at 125 pounds. He beat Brad Pickett in his debut via split decision, and of course, as he lost to Cejudo in his last matchup. For Horaguchi so far, 4-1 and one in the UFC. He's looked very good, but that Demetrius Johnson fight, as it is for a lot of fighters, is a very big step up in competition. He held, you know, he didn't look out of, completely out of place, but still he wasn't in that matchup where he ever had a chance to really win it. Physically, same reach. Camus one inch taller. Horaguchi is five years younger. He is fighting at home, which is a significant advantage. And the last time he was here, he had a TKO victory over uh, John Delos Reyes, which is, you know, obviously he's acclimatized to fighting in this environment. For Horaguchi, he has big knockout numbers. Nine of his 15 wins have come by knockout, including two in the UFC. For Camus, four wins by knockout, three wins by submission. He's seven and four in fights going the distance. He's had some very close and controversial decisions. He won that split decision against uh, Brad Pickett. A very controversial, unanimous decision against Kung Ho Kang that I felt he definitely did not win. That took place at Bantamweight. Uh, for Camus, he's a striking-oriented fighter. Good footwork, changes stances, lots, lots of feints and fakes, which can be very effective. Uh, stands at range, and he moves forward very aggressively. He has a good left hook, uppercut as well, front kick to the midsection, which can be a nice distance creator. And he will take some risks with some you know, flying knees and jumping attacks, which, you know, high risk, high reward if they do land flush, or it could result in him getting countered or put on his back. Uh, he does tend to lower his hands a little bit too much for my liking, sometimes attacks in straight lines, and will throw just single shots and not set them up. Uh, he has had issues as well with his takedown defense and gra uh, grappling. He's a good scrambler, but he can be put on his back if his opponent looks to do that. That shouldn't be a huge issue with Horaguchi. Uh, and we did see Kamis shooting for a takedown for, versus Pickett, so he could look to actually turn the tables and go for a takedown on his opponent in this matchup. But again, I primarily think this will be contested on the feet. For Horaguchi, he's a karate-based fighter. Kid Yamamoto training partner, so certainly he'll be gearing up for that matchup, uh, getting Kid get ready for his fight, as well as preparing for this matchup. But as a karate base, covers distance exceptionally well, kind of a younger version of Kid Yamamoto, uh, changes stances up, has power in both hands, he's exceptionally quick, and he attacks and blitzes, which can be very difficult to anticipate and defend against. Hard low kicks, will throw a nice body kick. He'll also attack the uh, midsection with a front kick. He will also fl throw flying knees. Uh, we saw against John Delos Reyes, he nearly stopped him with a hard kick to the body, which is very effective. A lot of the same things Camus does very well. Uh, look for him to throw a nice step-in left, hard-right combination. 
He'll use that left hook to counter, as we saw against Delos Reyes again. Uh, he's very calculated, looks for opening. Sometimes prolonged uh, periods of inactivity are a little bit concerning, especially if his opponent is working. And he also, just like came his hands down. Lots of movement, though. He will leave some openings and, you know, isn't the most defensively sound fighter there is out there. He could also possibly look for a takedown, but again, very unlikely. Uh, he does know how to finish if the fight gets to the ground as far as ground and pound. We saw him against Dustin Pegg put him away. If he postures up and starts unloading, his opponent will be in big trouble. The big concern for Horiguchi's coming off the title fight loss, is it a letdown or is it a learning experience? He's very young still. It's a tough fight. I think it's a learning experience. I think he has the ability to climb back up. For Camus, he's aggressive. He's going to engage. Uh, he has had trouble distance, distancing himself from his opposition in close fights. I don't think that will play well for him in a place known for favoring local fighters. Additionally, Camus traveling west to east is very tough. Plus, his two flyweight boats were against Brad Pickett, who was struggling with the cut to 125 pounds, and Henry Cejudo was exceptionally drained for that matchup. For Horiguchi, he's much more acclimatized to fighting 125 pounds. I think... He's mastered the cut now. He should be quicker, a little bit more technical than Camus. I think this has the potential to be a close fight. Horiguchi's power carries well here. I think home field advantage shows up, and my prediction is Koyuji Horiguchi to defeat Chico Camus by another decision. We head now to the co-main event of the evening. It's in the UFC's middleweight division. It's the number six ranked former strike force light heavyweight champion, Gegard Mousasi, 37-5-2, battles Ultimate Fighter finalist, primetime Uriah Hall of Jamaica. Uh, by way, or of USA by way of Jamaica with a 12 wins and 5 losses. Now, Musasi was initially scheduled to face Roan Carnero. Hall is stepping up on roughly 5 months notice. Hall last fought on August 8th at UFC Fight Night 74, so about 50 days between matchups. For Musasi, he has just 2 losses in his last 12 matchups against Jacare, Susan, Leota, Machida. Very big names he's fought. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to pick up the victory. He's still looking for a big victory that he can pick up to really cement himself in that upper echelon of the middleweight division. Unfortunately, this is not that type of fight. This is actually a very dangerous fight for Musasi. Low reward, high risk. For Uriah Hall, he's 4-1 in his last five fights in the fights in the UFC. After starting 2-0, he appears to have righted the ship. Unfortunately, that loss to Rafael Natal, which was close, was his for the taking. He just didn't go out and get it. It was kind of a bad performance and shows he still has some problems with executing. If he had picked up that victory, really, we'd be looking at a guy on the cusp of the top 15, I would think. He has wins over lower level guys like Ron Stallings, like Chris Lieben, like his opponent in his last matchup. The win over Thiago Santos is pretty decent considering how nasty Santos has looked and everything against everyone else he's fought. That fight was very close. A win over Gegard Mousasi would be huge, though, and really get Hall... Like escalate him very quickly up to a position where a lot of people expected him to be based on his ultimate fighter performance. Um, and this is that type of into the fire opportunity, you know, trial by fire, either live or die, basically. For Musasi, he's beaten guys below him, but again, he can't seem to break through into that upper echelon either. Hall has beaten fighters below him, but has struggled to step up in competition, and Musasi is the biggest fighter he has faced by far in the UFC, most talented, most accomplished. Physically, Musasi two inches taller at six foot two. Hall will have a three inch reach advantage, and uh, the former Strike Force fighter has a one is one year younger. Now, the experience advantage certainly lies with Musasi at 44 fights to 16. Additionally, Hall's never fought outside the UFC, and for Musasi, this is the 15th time he's fought in Japan and the seventh time in Saitama alone. So he's certainly acclimatized and will be the crowd favorite coming into this fight. Both guys have big knockout numbers. Musasi 19 of his 37 wins by knockout. Hall seven of 11 victories by knockout. Similar strikes landed per minute. Musasi though a Edge in strikes absorbed per minute, and it's almost by a strike and a half. So Hall takes almost 1.5 more strikes per minute from his opponent, which really shows up in a prolonged matchup. Uh, he's only been outlanded. Musasi's only been outlanded one time in his last nine UFC or Strike Force bouts. Even in the which was the loss of Jacare, where he was put on his back four times and really controlled on his uh, on his backside. Against Machida, he outlanded him in significant strikes, and overall, he's just a very effective striker both offensively and defensively. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for Uriah Hall, despite all of his talents. Uh, Rafael Natal and um, Thiago Santos had a lot of success outlanding him, outpointing him, and simply being busier fighters. And that has also been the case with less talented strikers, like look at Calvin Gaston, who was still very raw when they fought. He simply was busier than Hall and got the nod as a result. John Howard, who's a good striker in his own right, but... You know, it just seemed like Hall had the fight for the taking and didn't go out and get it, despite his advantage technical in technical skill. Uh, Hall overall seems to lack a lot of cohesion in his strikes, has prolonged periods of inactivity where he seems to be setting stuff up, st setting stuff up in his mind, but not executing. If his opponent stays busier and Hall doesn't pull the trigger, it really puts him back on the scorecards. Musasi at times has also had a little bit of issues with inact inactivity and lack of aggression, but he's much more calculated. He builds the attacks nicely, have a very strong jab, and I expect to see a lot of that in this fight. His defensive front game is going to give Hall a ton of trouble, but again, the key to Musasi's success will be his grappling in this fight. 
Uh, he's a black belt in judo, 12 wins by submission, including submitting Mark Munoz and Mike Kyle, six by re rear naked choke, so look for him to try and rotate to the back once the fight hits the ground. He uses wrestling, he's used his wrestling in the past when appropriate against Costa Filippo. He landed four takedowns. Uh, we also did the same against OSP back in Strike Force. He recognizes his vulnerability and he exploits it, and I think he'll do that something similar here. Hall, 76% takedown defense, but he's been taken down multiple times in fights. And, you know, the threat of being taken down also will stunt his striking. Hall has serious power, but again, Musasi is an absolute granite chin. And Hall doesn't have that work rate to outpoint him, you know, in a decision. He's 2-4 and four in decisions overall. He just simply is not going to outpoint him if he can't knock him out. This is a step up in competition for Hall. A quick turnaround, the travel to Japan, the grappling attack in Musasi. Those are all aspects of the fight. I don't think he can overcome them all. So my prediction is Gegard Musasi to defeat Uriah Hall. I'll take Musasi by submission. We move now to the UFC's heavyweight division. It's the eighth-ranked Josh, the Warmaster Barnett, 33-7-0. Returns to action is the number 11th-ranked Roy Big Country Nelson, 21 wins and 11 losses. Now, two veteran heavyweights, both guys trying to work their way back into title contention, and it certainly could be slipping away. More so for Roy Nelson, but certainly for both guys. Barnett is coming off a sizable layoff, last fighting in December 2013 against Travis Brown, so he hasn't seen action in 20 months. It was the second knockout of his career and the last one, you know, a long time between them. Uh, first in first came in U, at UFC 30 versus Pedro Hizo in 2001, so that could play with his psyche, but again, he's a tough guy, he's a veteran fighter and expect him to bounce back. For Roy Nelson, he has lost four of his last five matchups. Uh, coming, he recently suffered the second KO and real first real knockout loss of his career against Mark Hunt. He was beaten up badly by Alistair Overeem. Almost came back in the waning minutes of that matchup, but again lost another tough fight. Uh, Barnett, he was very close to title shot before the Brown fight. He beat Frank Mir, uh, who Roy Nelson lost to. Both guys fought Daniel Cormier, both lost to Daniel Cormier. But Barnett overall has been more successful in recent memory. Physically, Josh Barnett, 3 inches taller, he'll have a 6 inch reach advantage. Nelson should come in 10 to 15 pounds heavier. Uh, Barnett, one year younger. Now, the big issue with Roy Nelson, obviously, and I'm not one to talk, but he's, he's a very hefty fella. Uh, and his cardio has suffered as a result. He is also clo closing in on 40 years of age. Even in his younger years, it wasn't good, and despite his efforts to improve it, it's just something that's not there anymore. Uh, he has tried, as I said, to improve it. He, as I said, he almost KO'd over him in the last bit of the fight, so he's still dangerous. But overall, he is 1-9 in, in his last 10 fights to go beyond the opening round, and he's 2-9 in, in fights that go to decision on his career. Those are very concerning numbers. For Barnett, 4-3 in, in decisions, but he's 5-1 in, in his last 6 matchups to go outside of the first, so certainly a longer fight. And this is a 5-round fight, a longer fight favors the War Master. Both guys have significant fishing, finishing ability. Nelson, 14 wins by knockout versus Barnett. 20 of his 33 wins coming by submission. For Barnett, he has been knocked out twice. And the loss of Travis Brown, though, was a very unconventional knockout. Nelson has never been submitted as a BJJ black belt, but he has had issues on the mat. That's something I think Barnett could capitalize on. Uh, Cormier had three takedowns against Nelson. Mir had six. And he has had issues with people working him over in the clinch and wearing him out. Barnett is a catch wrestler. He has the ability to score big takedowns. He's an aggressive top position fighter. And and sometimes only needs one takedown to either dominate the round or potentially end the entire fight with a submission or top position ground and pound. I think he will either wear Nelson down by in the pursuit of the takedown or by putting on his back and grinding him into oblivion on the mat. The big concern for Barnett is that his you know, focus on closing the gap to look for takedowns brings him right into the wheelhouse of Roy Nelson, who has that big overhand right. We saw him stop Matt Mitrion with an uppercut. He's very dangerous if he can land that one punch. He has KO, KO victories over fighters that are bigger, more athletic, and more diverse strikers. And while Barnett is a capable striker, he's not Steve Maiochik, he's not Fabrizio Verdum as far as striking is concerned. He needs to be exceptionally careful on the feet. Barnett, the big question, is he past his prime? Has the layoff really affected him? You know, Nelson isn't the same fighter he used to be, but, you know, his game plan appears to be kind of, it kind of, we know what he's going to do. A lot of guys still have trouble stopping him from throwing that knockout punch. Nelson already has knockout wins over aging pride let veterans like Mirko Krokop and the recently retired Big Nog. Barnett would be a nice addition to kind of keep him in some level of relevance. I think Barnett, though, overall is going to close the distance. He's going to grind Nelson into that cage, and he's going to score takedowns and simply wear him out, and Nelson's just not going to be able to fire back. Five rounds, a five-round fight doesn't bode well for Nelson. Even though Barnett doesn't have world-class uh, cardio, if Nelson can't knock him out, I don't see him winning this matchup. And I think what's, what we're going to see happen is Barnett eventually wear him out. It might come in the later rounds, but my prediction is Josh Barnett to defeat Roy Nelson by submission. So those are my six main card predictions for UFC Fight Night 75. I rambled on a lot, so thanks for sticking with the video, so I will keep this very short. For all my preliminary picks, head over to KamikazeOverdrive.net. I've got a lot on my plate right now, and I'm trying to... Uh, 
make sure I get everything done. The bet packs will be posted as soon as possible. Certainly consider subscribing for the next three shows. I've had a lot of success recently, and you don't want to miss out on any future success. And uh, make sure you check out everything else I have to offer as far as other uh, predictors predictions other videos radio mma is something else worth looking at and uh again as always guys thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe and take care